Good, well, bang on time. So, uh, still plenty of people joining, but let's crack on. I always loathe these things when they start too late. So, welcome to uh, DQ Week. I'm Stephen Dan. I'm the Managing Director of Business Impact Solutions. And according to the team at DQ Global, I, am, I know a bit about marketing. I'm delighted to be joined today by Martin Doyle, the Chief Executive of DQ Global. Martin is, is one of the most respected and innovative data quality leaders. And we'll be exploring how the data management landscape has changed over the last 25 years and really thinking through what's going to happen next looking forwards. So we've got about 30 minutes together, at the end of which we've got some time for, for questions and answers. So please any, any, enter any questions that you wish um, as we go along and we'll pick up at the end. So before we get started, Martin, what's, what's DQ Week all about? Thanks for uh, kicking that off, Stephen, and, and thanks for, uh, for hosting this. Um, DQ Week, what's it all about? We, we put it together to raise awareness of the impact or the high impact that low quality data has on all of us. And we really wanted to create an informative, non-selling week that challenges perceptions and offers practical solutions to DQ problems. So why do we need it though? Why do we need a, a whole week on DQ quality? Well, <laughs> big subject. And we've been doing this for, for 25 years. Um, and unfortunately, the, the old adage, garbage in, garbage out, is still as true today as it was uh, back then. Unfortunately, with, uh, with new faster technology, it's just moved on to fast garbage in, fast garbage out. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the problem is challenging. I mean, data is everywhere, as we know. It's growing at exponential rates. And uh, it's still, in my opinion, not a priority for many businesses. Now, everybody gets excited about these shiny new tools, be that AI, machine learning, business intelligence, et cetera. Yet the quality of the data that's fueling those systems is still frankly poor. And I often say it's like misfueling your car, which by the way, I did once, uh, putting petrol in my diesel and let me assure you that it didn't end well. Um, a big bill and a lot of time off the road. So in short, there needs to be a step change towards treating data as an asset. And the idea of holding this week was to raise awareness, as I say, um, build success through and help our clients through better data and align those business stakeholders to the value of higher quality data and treat data as a, as a cherished asset. Certainly would be great if, if, if data was treated as a, as a cherished asset, wouldn't it? So what can we expect during the week? Well, a series of short 30 minute sessions. I know everybody's busy. We have short time spans. So really good. They were short and sharp. Um, we're trying to put informative content together and one that i'm really excited about is this thursday where we preview our dq for excel and dq on demand offerings great looks good so let's change focus and let's talk about dq global you know where did all of this start from oh uh, well a bit of a while back now um i had actually originally trained as a mechanical engineer and had always wanted to get into it so a few years prior to starting dq global um, I started a company implementing what we now know as CRM systems. Uh, back then, it was contact management. And customers were asking us all the time to assemble their data uh, from various sources. And I soon discovered that there were little or no tools in CRM to help. And that CRM companies were great at the container, as they still are, but not managing the content. So. DQ Global was formed 25 years ago. In fact, it's our anniversary um, next month. And we, we built matching technology to handle the relational data. Um, and that was really because we were in the CRM world instead of the flat file sort of direct mailing world, which has stood us in good stead, I have to say, over, over the period. And those matching techniques and technologies are the foundation for what we do today. And you know, it's evolved from flat files to relational data DG to single customer view, and now single customer view to, to master data management. So that was a really interesting change going from, you know, engineering to, to IT. What's that, what's the big shift there? Well, I think engineering and uh, air, air conditioning was my, my original background. Um, you might think there's, there's no similarity and, and there are, clearly big differences but ironically and i've often thought that air conditioning data conditioning 
you know, we were cleaning air, standardizing in a way, formatting. So there's a lot of similarities. I mean, in air conditioning, you're pumping air around. Now we're pumping data around. You mix air, you blend it. We mix data, we blend data. Uh, you were filtering, heating, cooling, humidifying, dehumidifying. And that was all about improving air quality. So then, then you know, it's very similar in, in lots of respects. And then, then you supply it to the, the people that care, you know, the people who are breathing that air in and out. And now we're supplying data to the applications and users that rely upon that data. So in many ways, conceptually, it's, it's very similar. So have you found then that the problems have changed much over time, over the last 25 years? Mm, yes and no. I mean, data problems are still there. I mean, it's there's still, you know, it didn't matter whether it was a mainframe or a or an iPhone. I mean, the da data is data. I mean, that's that's a discussion for another day, and perhaps later on in the week we'll surface what data is and the difference between data and information. But I think the terminology is consistent, regardless of the. Well, I say that's probably not true. I mean. There is different terminology. I mean, people get mixed up with, with is it a customer? Is it a supplier? Is it a, a suspect, a prospect? Um, we could be talking about single guest views in hospitality, single student view in education, and in healthcare, it would be a single patient view. But ultimately, what everybody wants is a, a single view, and we call that a single record view. Um, Master data management is about linking multiple systems. We call that master record view because you're not, it's not really about the data, but that's a debate for another day. Um, the applications definitely change, but the data is often lifted and shifted um, and the applications just still don't manage the content. What about new technologies with, with artificial intelligence, machine learning and, and, and cloud, for example? Well, good question. Um, I think that they've been very good at surfacing issues, actually, because they still rely upon correct data as an input. I mean, the data is the input to those systems. They manipulate, manage, and learn from that data. And actually, AI, machine learning are actually showing up poor data quality, and they're doing it faster. Hence the rubbish in, rubbish out, now fast rubbish in, fast rubbish out. So I guess that means that we get, we get to understand what the problems are quicker than maybe in the past. But I'll tell you, one of the things that, that really that really bugs me, one of the things that I, don't, I just don't get, is, is why is there still rubbish data in all our systems? Hmm. Well, it'll be interesting to get some feedback from, from our audience. Um, in my opinion, the secret assassin and number one reason is, is lack of ownership. Um, and if you ask across the enterprise who owns the data, I suspect if you ask IT, they'll say it's the users. If you ask the users, they'll say IT. If you ask the business execs, they, they either don't know or frankly don't care or didn't care. Um, so yes, yeah, challenging one. I like the, like the concept of a secret assassin, but can you expand on that? Well, yeah, I mean, I think the issue, uh, we're really talking about ownership and the secret assassin, you know, with people not owning the data, but I kind of got this, maybe it's an engineering thing, but I've got this concept of the distance between the data error, which is a point of capture, if you like, and the data pane. So you know, if somebody's putting data into a system, they don't feel that pain immediately. It's not like somebody standing on a swivel chair to change a light bulb, which is a pretty daft thing to do, and you fall off. Well, you'll feel the pain immediately. Um, if you haven't electrocuted yourself, then you're going to break an arm or something when you fall off the chair. But if somebody adds an incorrect email, a phone number, or, or whatever to a system, they don't feel the impact. They might, they might, if you're lucky, get a message that says the email is invalid or something. But there's ways around that. I've seen people put nine zeros in a phone number field just to get around it, or a full stop in a field just to get around it. We, you know, we know that happens all the time. It's the poor call center guy the marketer, the analyst, who have to do all this scrap and rework to fix things downstream from the guy or the person that put that poor data in. And worst of all, the AI machine learning is being trained on poor quality data. I mean, that's a, that's a terrifying prospect. You know, AI, AI being trained on the wrong data is, is indeed terrifying. Absolutely. So, imagine, you... Stephen, imagine Stephen allowing them to drive your car. 
<laughs> it's frightening, isn't it? Yeah, you kind of really, 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 really want that to be right, don't you? I so, think you kind of do, yeah. How do you, how do you see this being solved? Um, how do I see it being solved? I think it's a top-down issue. I think, I think definitely leaders need to see it as a business initiative. There are, there are no data quality initiatives. I mean, at the end of the day, it's a business initiative. It's about reducing cost, which means driving waste out of your business. I mean, it's scrap and rework. And, and we all know that the best way to make money is not wasting it. So reduce your costs, obviously. Um, you want to increase revenues without doubt. So maybe around that is customer retention. I mean, you all know that it takes, you know, seven people will, uh, seven times harder, sorry, to, uh, to retain a customer. And if you upset a customer, they'll tell seven or more people. So you want to increase your revenues. And one of the easiest ways is to retain your customers and mitigate risk, avoid fines, avoid, uh, you know, litigation. So, and the risk of rework again. So I think it's all about collective responsibility and letting everybody in the organization know their role, their place. And that's got to come from the top down. I mean, if you're a football team, then, you know, the manager manages, but the, the owner of the football club sets the tone. Um, we've got our defenders and goalkeepers stopping the ball going in their net. So that's a bit like us stopping rubbish going into our system. You've got the midfield players uh, moving the data or moving the ball from the backs to the forwards and the forwards have got to put it into wherever it's got to go in a data sense, in a football sense, put the ball in the net. So everybody needs to know where they are, but they need to know how they form a part of the system and avoid, um, you know, these departmental demarcations. So it's got to be top down because pushing string is, is neither effective or, or sustainable. <laughs> True. So having, having, founded DQ Global 25 years ago, um, you know, what happened next? You know, what have been the key, the key challenges, the key milestones along the way? Mm, challenges and milestones. So challenges. Um, I think, you know, the, the biggest one, and it's still to a degree, is, is getting people out of denial. They have to, first of all, admit there's a data quality problem. It's a bit like you know, Alcoholics Anonymous and having a seven step program, first thing you gotta do is realize you are an alcoholic and I'm a dataholic. So first thing to do is realize that there is a, a problem. Um, I think that people are afraid to lift the lid on data quality issues and they, they might behave a bit like an ostrich, you know, with a head in the sand, um, which actually undermines migration, integration analytics and, and insufficient budget or time is ever allocated in, in projects that we've been involved in with migration. Um, people put in a new CRM or a new ERP or a new whatever. And I rarely see on the project plan that there's sufficient time and it will come back to bite you. It's a, it's a debt that you're going to pay at some point, like a data quality debt down, down the line. Um, you'd, you'd asked about milestones, uh, I think. So, I think the milestones along the way have been desktop computing, client server, of course, and clearly the cloud where we're able to integrate things much more um, cleverly. And, and that's been a nice thing about creating lots of connectors. Um, I think dealing with relational and structured and semi-structured data. I mean, data is everywhere. It's in different formats and different structures, different applications. So that's, uh, you know, kind of milestone in the way that we work. And you can't have a conversation, can you, without AI and machine learning, where, as we said, if you train it correctly, you will make very bad decisions with a high level of certainty. Uh, yes. And what about, what about uh, GDPR as an issue? What's, what impact does that have? Well, huge, actually. I, I probably should have brought that up earlier. Um, GDPR was a big tipping point, without doubt. It, it raised awareness from, from the basement to the boardroom. So, you know, data's not a sexy subject for execs. It's, it's not of interest generally. They want their BI, their dashboards, et cetera. And one of the funny things that somebody said to me the other day is that, you know, there's no interest unless they've got to pay overtime for these reports. And when the overtime gets requested to do things, to fix the data, then, you know, the issues get raised. So it's come from the basement to the boardroom from GDPR. The possibility of literally eye-watering fines 
and litigation against company owners and directors for poor data, falsifying information, um, you know, the whole GDPR compliance issue has, has moved it, has genuinely moved data from a nice to have to a business critical agenda. No, absolutely. And in the world of in the world of marketing, I mean, the much of the reaction to GDPR has been understandably negative and there's been some overreactions to it as well. But there's no question it's it's raised the profile of the importance of data and, and the value of getting it right. Without, without doubt. So I think in thinking backwards in time, you know, what's what's been the proudest moment that as the as the founder and CEO of DQ Global that you've you've experienced? Actually, that 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 really is an easy one for us. I mean, We've helped lots and lots of companies fix data and, and do all kinds of things. Um, it's been a few medical ones that, that we've been involved in, which probably saved people's lives. But this this was the key standout for us was Hurricane Katrina. So back in August 2005, um, when that Category 5 hurricane hit, um, Microsoft put out a call to, to one of our business partners and the business partner asked us, could we help out? And of course we said, absolutely we'd love to help if we can now the problem was that all these family members had been separated and they were in storm shelters churches sports halls etc and there was data being collected so billy bob and rob and robbie or whatever were all um, in different shelters and the loved ones were phoning in to to register their interest well they used our matching technology back then and we cross-matched various lists and there were 200,000 records at the time and as I say a very proud moment we were literally able to reconnect families um, that had been separate children we'd missed their parents and relatives lost to each other 4,000 people reunited overnight so it was a really nice you know emotional uh, great story. Uh, it's a fantastic use of use of data tools for good and, and, and marvelously working on something with a real purpose. Oh, far away from the kind of some of the trivial stuff and the nice to have issues on on data this is kind of yeah really significant absolutely Fantastic. absolutely so how how have you um and your team for that matter managed to stay at the forefront and and keep on innovating um well it's always challenging isn't it um we keep an eye on market trends of course the key is listening to customers um you know, they're always they're always bringing challenges and interesting problems and new ideas and suggestions on things so that's key I mean, it has credit has to go to our, our team you know the diligent uh, boys and girls and that work for us um, to, to help us you know to be where we are and help clients incremental improvements just you know little improvements can make a, a massive important you make 10 little improvements you know or or one massive one so step changes um i'm afraid my background as an engineer being a bit of a perfectionist probably um may have some impact and always wanting to improve refine drive out waste etc and improve effectiveness um because i think effectiveness is the key really doing the right things right um in recent years connecting to lots and lots of different cloud sources on-premise applications enterprise service buses which allow us through APIs and, and data services to, to really glue business processes together. So yeah, that, I think that's about it. I mean, that's great. I mean, you know, connectivity to, to, to so many different ecosystems and so many different, different, different clients, you know, must give you exposure to, to lots of different ways of thinking. Oh yeah. Um, I mean, the great thing is, I mean, we just help our clients to succeed. That's our goal. I mean, we've got smart people for sure, but there's plenty of smart clients out there worldwide. I mean, any country in the world you go to, there are people who are coming up with innovative ideas, new ways, new problems, and we are learning with them all the time. And I mean, I, yeah, you're always trying to think of new ways of thinking, but the secret is I think to have two ears, one mouth, if you like, listen twice as long as you speak and have a straightforward and open, honest conversation with those clients because we're just trying to help them succeed. And, yeah. and we feel if we can help them succeed, then surely we'll be successful. That's a good philosophy. So, so what are the key lessons over the last 25 years? Oh boy, 25 years, it seems like it's flown by, but um, well, every day is a school day, that's for sure. 
Um, there's always something new to learn, isn't there? Um, I think it kind of reminds me that Aristotle, you know, thousands of years ago, who was saying quality is not an act, it's, it's a habit. So back to that, you know, getting people involved and, and getting it as part of their everyday life, I think is important. I know that pain's a great driver for change. So when people are in pain over their data, they act quickly. Otherwise, it's you know got on the back burner. Um, data quality is definitely not an IT problem. It's a business problem, and it's a it's a you know it's a business initiative, not a data quality initiative. Um, confidence in data is pretty fragile. That's for sure. Um, when when one piece of data is seen to be wrong, then there's a loss of trust, and and people think the whole data is wrong. Um, we talked about bad decisions with a high level of certainty. Um, what else? Let's think. Ownership is still a big issue. It's, it's definitely a big issue. Um, actually, it reminds me of a story which I've, I've, I've actually got. Um, so I, I need to just look away for a moment to, to remember. But it's a story about um, somebody, nobody, somebody and everybody. Um, it's a DQ story about four people named everybody, somebody, anybody and nobody and there was an important dq job to be done and everybody was sure that somebody would do it now anybody could have done it but nobody did it somebody got angry because it was everybody's job and everybody thought anybody could do it but nobody realized that everybody wouldn't do it it ended up that everybody blamed somebody but nobody did what anybody could have so it's kind of sums up nicely i think this issue of uh, responsibility that's a great. That's a great story. I must, Probably must true of uh, lots of walks of life, though, isn't it? Not just data quality. Eh? Absolutely is. I must remember that one. Yeah. So yeah. you've said you said on a couple of occasions in in this chat that, that that people can make very bad decisions with a high level of certainty. Um, can you have you got any examples of that? Um, well, two spring to mind. One was the uh, it's almost utter disbelief that two organisations of such calibre could make such a mistake where NASA and the European Space Agency managed to smash 125 million pounds worth of, of uh, spacecraft into the planet um, because one was working in metric units and one was working imperial. They managed to, as a result, with a high level of certainty, compute what the orbit should be and where the thing was, and they got mixed up and they smashed it into the planet. Now, 125 million is a lot for a, an orbiter spacecraft, but there's probably 10 times that in the value of the data that they otherwise didn't get as a result of that, that mix up. Um, and another one's a bit closer to home for us uh, in the UK. Believe it or not, duplicate NHS numbers where a patient, two patients may share the same number, which is just incomprehensible from a medical point of view, because you might be judging the, you know, the a clinical judgment on past data or applying something new, it applies to the wrong person. And, you know, you give somebody penicillin who's allergic to it, they, they die. So it's putting people at risk. I mean, it's you know, mad, but hey, it can happen. That's phenomenal. But looking, so looking ahead, what does the future hold for data and data management? You know, what are the new challenges that we're all going to have to face and deal with? And, and how is this, this landscape going to change? Um, okay, future and landscape. Well, it's going to be, it's going to be more and more integration between business systems and applications um, more orchestrations i think there'll be more more active data management as i call it so you know kind of near real time uh, reporting a bit like an internet of things for mm -hmm. for people data so there'll be much more event loops so as people move die have you know childbirth whatever i think that that will be much more interactive and I think that from a, a, a personal point of view, apart from data protection um, issues, there will be more data on things like social preferences, social styles, where we actually understand how to communicate with people in a style that they want to be communicated with, which means you know, hyper-personalization, really. Um, and of course, you can't talk about the future without AI and machine learning. Um, but as I say, <laughs> they better have good data otherwise uh, when they drive our cars around we're going to be in trouble <laughs> so what's so what's next for dq global um continue innovating keep listening to our clients um 
obviously keep evolving the products, mm -hmm. um, helping customers really solve problems, creating greater trust in their enterprise. And I mentioned earlier that, that we're, we're doing a launch on, on Thursday, if I recall, uh, for our DQ for Excel. And just to put that in context, there's 750 million users of Excel worldwide. And, and our goal is wherever they are, whatever they're doing, we want them all to benefit from higher quality data. And you'll see how we can deliver that on Thursday. Um, so I hope you invited Sachin and Adela, Stephen, did he? Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure I did. I mean, it'll probably pop up, pop up in the Q&A later on. Oh, that's excellent, yeah. So Which great. is just, just a nice nice point to remind you uh, is to start putting any questions in so that we can pick up those uh, towards the end uh, within the next five minutes or so. Thank you. So, um, in fact, that brings us straight onto onto on, onto questions. It's a good good place place to do that. So, what questions have we got coming through? Just let me have a quick check and see. Okay, so yeah, one here coming through saying, well, what's what's been the impact um, from a data perspective of of COVID nineteen? Wow, that's a good one. Um, well, I think one that occurs to me is in speaking to a bank actually in the US on Friday, due to the home working scenario, they were telling me that there's been lots of problems where people have been involved in processes that nobody knew about. They thought they were automated, but they actually weren't automated. People were, you know, the sticky back plastic or the glue between these things and were fixing things along the way. So I think one of those is definitely how um, this will uncover lots of issues where data processes is end to end and, and are not as end to end as people might think. So that's, mm -hmm. that's definitely an impact I think of, of COVID um, and possibly the ability to do more remote working and put better rules and logic in. Now, how do you think that's gonna play out on a, on a global global basis? Not not the virus, obviously, but in terms of the way of, of the management of data. Well, I think I think also there's going to be a if there isn't already, I think organisations are going to be looking to ensure that their data is in the cloud, because if you've got it on multiple machines everywhere, you know this whole migrate your whole workforce to the to you know remote working. If you've got centralised data. Um, centralized processes then it's much easier for people to operate remotely i mean you can operate with a you know any any device brilliant i've got a question here from from dan saying hi martin great introduction to dq week you talk about high data quality but how can you measure data quality uh, well i actually i actually worked on a, on a panel um for data management um panel dharma and we came up with a number of um, what were called dimensions. Now, uh, don't get me started on this because I, I, as an engineer, I, did, I really hated the term dimensions because I've, I've never heard anybody ask for 10 kilograms of their very finest data or uh, three meters of your finest customer. Um, so we won't go into that though. Um, so we came up with a, a set of dimensions. These are you know, well-known in the data quality industry. And there was uh, consistency, uniqueness, timeliness, validity, accuracy, which I would argue is not a dimension. It's a result of multiple dimensions or multiple characteristics and completeness. So if you're looking at a data set, then you know how complete something is. You know how valid something is. You know how consistent something is. You know if it's been delivered in a timely fashion. So those are definitely measures of, of, of quality. Excellent. Thank you. Good. So we're coming to the end now. I just want to, to close off by um, reminding you of the other events that are on this week throughout DQ Week. So, so tomorrow we've got a session on add rocket fuel to your dynamic CRM, uh, perfect and merge masterclass. On Wednesday, there's the launch of DQ for Excel and DQ on demand, the official launch event. On Thursday, I'm particularly interested in this one, the, the DMG events data strategy roadmap with guest speaker Sonny Bath. And then finally on Friday, the Leaning Tower of Data, a DQ Studio Masterclass. 
So I'd, it'd be really great if you could join as many of those as you as you are able to do. I'll certainly be dipping into those as much as I can. Um, I think there's another question just come through. Um, yeah, another question. Just something. I think the best way to convince business on DQ is the money. How can you value DQ issues? Great question. Wow, great question. Yeah. I think you're right. There's, that, that's been an issue for years. Um, I've, I've often felt that the people that should actually own the data is the finance department of all people um, because they should put value because it's an asset. How do you value it? I think you've got to try and compute or calculate the pain of this data. Um, and that is both in you know, physical and uh, brand damage You've got to you've got to look at this as a complete package of of issues and challenges, the cost of remediation, rework, um, the time that's spent by people, um, BI, bad decisions that have been made, as I said, on on incorrect data. All of these add up, and some of them are tangible, and some of them are intangible. Um, there are some books on this actually in the data quality space where where people have tried to um, compute or calculate the cost and they use a bit of a risk model, I think, to do that. So uh, a great point. Absolutely. hundred percent true because the execs will care about the money. And I'm sure, I'm sure it'll be something to be touching on, you know, during other sessions during this yeah. week. Yeah. So that's it. We're up. Um, time is now past. And I'd just like to thank everyone for, for joining today and, and being part of this, this first session in DQ Week. Particularly thank you to Martin for, for, for joining this session and being so, so open and so insightful. So thank you very much to everyone. And we hope you have a great week and look forward to seeing you in further sessions as we go. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, Stephen. Thank right. you very much. Bye all.